This is Dennis Ramundi with the Coffee League, uh, where we discuss everything related to coffee. Find us at thecoffeeleague.com. Follow us at, at the Coffee League. Uh, my guest today, the current Swedish barista champ, Matt Winton. Uh, Matt, originally from Australia, now living in Stockholm and working for Drop Coffee. And I have to say, uh, Drop Coffee, one of my favorite. We interviewed uh, Joanna Am not long ago, our founder head roaster there and uh, uh, world champion roaster. And, and, I, and I also want to say that, uh, Matt, your accomplishment, uh, congratulations. To be the Swedish barista champion, you've got to be really good because Sweden is one of the uh, coffee capitals of the world. It really is. Uh, for those who, many of my listeners are in America and other countries, uh, y- you know, it's um, uh, really leading the way uh, in, in many ways in what we call third wave coffee. Lighter roast coffee drop uh, is one of the, the, the top. I was just in Stockholm. Many great cafes. Which drop is right up there with the top cafes in the world. So, uh, and Matt, uh, my understanding is you're a head barista there, and uh, you've only been in coffee a few years. So your accomplishment is that much more impressive. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for taking the time to come on today. Oh well, thanks so much for the kind words, mate. Um, yeah, you're pretty much. Summed it up all right there. <laughs> all right. Well, let, let's super, talk super about fun, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about your journey. Two journeys. Your coffee journey. Ooh, yeah. First, first your journey from Australia to Sweden. How that happened, and at what point did you get involved in specialty coffee? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so it goes back a long way. My mum's Swedish, um, mm. so I always had a bit of a draw to, to come to Sweden and Europe. Um, back in 2016, I. Uh, used to be, it was like my old life, I used to be an aircraft engineer. Um, I started off in the military in Australia, in a, mm-hmm. like a whole other world to coffee pretty much. Um, and I was traveling around Europe doing contracts all over the place. And I actually found myself in Switzerland. Um, and that was where my coffee journey sort of began. Uh, I was working in a small specialty cafe there um, just after like almost as a summer job after a contract finished and decided I wanted to just stay in coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a pretty, pretty awesome job. I got to talk to people all the time, learn a new skill, um, everything, I, everything about the job I loved then, and I still love now, so it's pretty awesome. Right. Let, let, let me ask you about what's the uh, coffee culture like in Switzerland, and, and was there somebody in particular that you uh, studied with or inspired you to become, uh, you know, to go delve deeply into barista skills? Um, I think that the the coffee culture pretty much anywhere is different to the specialty coffee culture. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that now after living and working in a few different cities in coffee, um, that like the traditional coffee culture in Switzerland, for example, uh, it's like a mix of sort of Italian, German, French, just like the rest of the country. Um, and it was like a lot of cafe creme, espresso drinks, you know, Switzerland's mm-hmm. the home of Nespresso as well. Um, so there was a lot of stuff like that, sort of like how in Sweden, the, the, um, coffee culture is all about filter coffee and, and sort of like batch brews, but the specialty coffee scene is another thing. Again, um, the specialty coffee scene in Switzerland was small, uh, growing slowly. I think a lot of it was based in Zurich, a little bit in Basel, a little bit in Bern, touch in Geneva. Um, but those of us who were there, we were trying to do, you know, as good things as possible, um, at the start, I don't think there was any really sort of one mentor or one person. Um, it was quite a small scene, like I said, but there was a few of us who, who we could talk to a lot about coffee. Um, particularly, uh, when I started working at a shop called Mame, which had, um, well, at the time there was three national champions working there. It was, wow. it was a really, really crazy sort of thing that, uh, both Emmy, Matthew, who were the owners, uh, their partners. Matthew won the mm-hmm. Swiss Barista, Emmy won the Swiss Brewers at the time, um, and then I happened to win the Swedish, which is just insane. It was super cool, but it sort of was a testament to our passion for coffee and what we were trying to do. Um, Mummy is still running very, very well. They've just opened up a second shop, um, and the business, like the specialty coffee scene in Switzerland, was, was absolutely booming at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Okay, so then when you, you went from Switzerland to Sweden... Uh, was it yeah. for a particular job? And is the coffee scene, is the specialty coffee community uh, uh, significantly uh, bigger in, in in Sweden than it was in Switzerland? 
Um, so, yeah, I did move pretty much just to come work with Drop. After I met Joanna at the national championships, we just vibed really mm-hmm. well. Um, and we were just on the phone a couple of weeks after the competition. Um, I was due to leave Switzerland anyway um, and asked her if I could come up and work with her. And she was like, yeah, that sounds good. So <laughs> the rest is sort of history. Right. Um, but the, as far as the coffee scene and like the specialty coffee scene especially goes, um, it's it's funny. You see the same people everywhere. You see the people who right. are new to it. You see the people who've been there for a long time and are a bit, uh, I suppose, less motivated for change. Um, but as soon as we got to, as soon as I got to Stockholm, I met up with a bunch of really, really great people here. Um, and we started our own little thing here in Stockholm. We decided to call it just The Grid. I don't even know how that name came around. But it's basically a bunch of us in the specialty coffee industry um, working at several different cafes, not aligned to any one particular cafe or roastery or anything like that. And we just started doing events for the community. Um, so there's been lots of like home baristas and there's been roasters and there's been just people interested and other, other professional baristas as well. We all just come together probably at least once a month doing some sort of event. We had uh, a latte I throw down to start off with, typical. Um, we had an educational cupping where a friend of mine from... Um, from Switzerland came up and she's a, a lab technician. She brought like some defect cuppings and like some sensory stuff. We're just doing anything we can to sort of bring the community together and raise the standard at the same time. And so far it's, it's working a lot. Like we just see people coming out of the cracks here around Stockholm. Um, I think in Sweden itself, there's a, there's a huge specialty coffee scene. that's very, very large. Um, the roasters seem to be very spread out in Sweden. Um, there's some as far North, I think around, Umeå, right up in the north of Sweden, is like Buddha's Cafe Roastery and uh, a couple of others up that way. Um, and then across west, you've got like Gothenburg and Helsingborg and Malmö and Lund, um, and then some in Stockholm as well. So it's really, really spread out and diverse. Um, I would say that everything, like we all have the same sort of thing where we're all trying for more lighter roast than probably in the States um, or a lot of Central Europe. And I don't know if that's where originally this light roast Scandinavian thing came from or not, but um, there seems to be a lot of it here around around Sweden. I don't know if you've got me there, Dennis. Can you hear me now? Uh, Hello. Ah, there, there we, we go. go. Okay, yeah. Sure. Back. So live radio, this is what, uh, live podcasting anyway. But I was just saying, uh, <laughs> uh, Scandinavia, in terms of a light roast, uh, certainly has, has been in the forefront. You know, I've been to Coffee Collective in, in Copenhagen. I've been, saw Tim Windelbo, uh, interviewed him mm-hmm. up in Oslo. Uh, Stockholm, mm. amazing coffee scene. I was at Gast recently, and uh, and uh, you know Johan Nister- and Nistrom and and uh, uh, Pascal's. There was a woman there, uh, Fatima. I interviewed. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm sure a friend of yours. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 just uh, um, um, give me his name. He's he's 17 years old and he's kind of phenomenal at that age uh, to be doing mm, Vincent, Vincent Vincent Caroni. Uh, yeah. He was terrific. So. So that's going on. But in the States, if you go to uh, uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, I think Stumptown really got it going there. And then you have uh, Seattle, Washington, San Francisco, amazing coffee scene there. But now New York City, for instance, in the last uh, 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 just in the last five years, six years, it's gone from about seven or eight specialty coffee shops to about 80, literally 80. And I know Omar Magistad, who was the... Uh, uh, head barista at Coffee Collective in Copenhagen is now mm-hmm. at Brownville Roasters in New York. So a lot of European yep. influence coming in, but you're you're in the heart of it. I mean, you're working with Drop Coffee, and, and that's no exaggeration. I've been around, you know, Drop Coffee, uh, Johan Nistro, and these some of these places are just world world class. That uh, you know, up there with everyone, and I think it, it's it's a process of education and catching on. And I'd like to get your thoughts on it. To me. Uh, and I'm, I approach coffee as a journalist. I'm no expert in coffee like you are, but over the last year, having visited probably 500 cafes and been writing about it and podcasting about it, I've learned a lot. And it's like 
probably wine was 50 years ago, where people used to just drink mm. these table wines, these blends, and then people got into specific wines, specific grapes from just specific regions, and and then mm. uh, people's tastes evolved, and and, uh, mm. and and this is what happens. I, I in regard to that, tell me a little bit about your own uh, uh, evolution in terms of your own coffee taste. What you st- what you used to drink is coffee, and what you drink now. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, growing up in Australia, there was always quite a high coffee standard. Um, people sort of think I don't know. I've met a few people who think that's a bit of an exaggeration, or like, oh yeah, okay, sure, Australia has great coffee, whatever. But it, there's just a, a no. No one accepts a lower standard of coffee in Australia. Um, particularly Melbourne has just a ridiculously high high quality like it's just hard to find a bad cup um anywhere that that doesn't do a very good job uh just sort of people don't go there um and like we're just all very i don't know almost coffee snobbish there's there's a just a high standard so i started off drinking you know coffee with milk over in uh over in australia and i remember my definitely remember my first special specialty coffee experience i went to a small cafe in brisbane called reverend's and the barista there, he served me this coffee, which happened to be a natural Ethiopian called Purple Haze. And I was still drinking it with milk at the time. And he was like, hey, man, check this out. Have one of these. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit less milk because I think it works better with this coffee. And I was like, no, oh, all right, cool. I remember drinking it and just thinking, oh, this tastes weird. Um, it didn't really taste like, uh, like the coffee I was used to, something a bit more chocolatey, sort of nutty taste. Um, but I went back there the next day and the week after and every sort of day that I could. And that was where I, like, I started to learn a little bit more about specialty. He gave me like some filter coffee beans and I bought a V60 and then just started, you know, just drinking specialty coffee. It was super cool. Um, used to go there every Monday night for like a few, a few weeks in a row and learning more and more, learn how to like pull shots and learn how to steam milk a little bit and make a V60, stuff like that. Right. But at the time, it was definitely just like give me natural Ethiopian, full fruity, full sweet. Um, didn't really have much time for washed coffees at the time. Um, but that's, I think that's a pretty common experience. Right, most right, people yeah. that I talk to, they have that natural only, big sweetness, big fruity sort of coffees. And then the other stuff comes later. Um, and again, a little bit like what you said with wines, like your, your taste just adapts and you change and you like things more. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. What, what I would recommend, uh, I have a lot of people email in and uh, some of the people that listen are real coffee nerds. Other people, they want to learn more. And what I would say is go to a cafe, speak to a good, uh, knowledgeable barista, uh, maybe get some single origin, uh, 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 recommend that you have a pour over there, uh, mm. you know, get a Chemex, get a V60, get an AeroPress mm. or whatever at home so you can make your own. It's very cheap and easy to do. Get a nice little hand grinder and uh uh which is what what i do as i travel and uh you Mm. you have a whole different experience but i think a lot of it is knowledge and a lot of it uh a lot of the cafes now uh that i've visited in the u.s and in europe uh even provide courses and classes you can take uh Mm. i I wanted to also ask you about you you're obviously a a competitor on a very high level uh being the uh swedish barista champion what what got Mm. you into the competitions and how did being a competitor affect your uh, whole uh, uh, approach uh, to coffee and your skill level as a barista? Ah, that's an awesome question. Uh, getting into competition. Um, I first started listening to podcasts actually right at the very start of, um, of like my coffee career. Like when I was setting up the cafe in the morning, I would just be listening to podcasts and, and trying to suck up as much knowledge. And it really helped me make me feel like I was part of a, a bigger sort of community. Um, particularly Tampa Tantrum was one of the ones that I listened to a lot mm-hmm. and they spoke a bit about competition. Um, so I started looking into what this competition is and eventually met a few people who had competed, Matthew and Emmy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember just thinking like, uh, just more or less like, all right, bugger it, I'm just going to compete. Let's do this thing. I thought, it, yeah, this thing should be easy. I've seen videos of people do it. It shouldn't be a problem. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you start looking into it and you start, you know, find a coffee and find a routine, find something to talk about and you start practicing and then you have to put the words over the top of the motion and you realize, oh, crap, there's a a hell of a lot more to this than I thought. Uh, I thought it was just going to be me standing there talking shit and and, uh, making coffee at the same time. 
but it's actually very, very intense. You have to do a lot of really, really uh, finesse sort of things um, while delivering this presentation. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty lucky that uh, some of the training that I've done outside of coffee has been with um, some like sort of martial arts and uh, more mindful practices. So that's helped me really develop a bit of a practice where I could practice my routine in a way that would help me on stage, but also in the flow of life, in the flow of things and get in the zone more or less. Right, that, that and when I can find that, yeah. yeah. I, want, I want to talk to you. Sorry, go on. I haven't discussed that before. Meditation is something I've been involved with for, for years and uh, TM in particular, but it's, it's ca- how ah, coffee awesome. relates me to too. <laughs> I've, I've had a number of people say to me, you know, talk to me about the spiritual side of coffee. There's one guy in California He's a roast today. Really, he wants to come on the show and talk about that specifically. And it's true, this idea yeah. of mindfulness and being in the moment and focused and, and uh, having a kind of an inner silence while you're focused on what you're doing. And this really does come out. When I watch those competitions, uh, and I was just at the Seattle Coffee uh, Expo, and there, there were major competitions there. And I thought, how mm-hmm. would I feel in one of those situations? I don't have the skill level to go in a, in a competition but it, it would be nerve wracking because you're 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 making the coffee. You have people that are actually judges tasting it, and then the whole time that you're doing this, you have to kind of tell a story. Is that right? And uh, putting all those things yeah. together, how did how did you how did you train for it? Um, so uh, you pretty much the nail on the head there. Like it is it is telling the story and doing the technical things, and then uh, you know delivering a product, and all this does come at once. Um, there was a moment where in my routine and in the world, uh, this year, um, where I was walking back to the machine, I just started laughing and you only capture a little bit on on the, um, on the video, but like, I was just having such a good time, just so in the zone. And for me, when I stopped thinking about the judges as people there to take scores and started thinking about them as people who I need to make their job easier, their job is to write write things down on that piece of paper that are applicable to my score. And from there, I can either, you know, do well or do bad. The result wasn't really much of a, a concern for me. Um, I just wanted to give the best presentation I could, like, you know, and, and in, in the competition, everything is the lead up to it. Everything is the training. On on the day, I could have uh, walked over and, and spilled a shot all over the judges and, you know, been disqualified for whatever reason. So for me, the, the actual competition, it wasn't as important as the build-up on a personal level. Um, all of the training that I did, like I think I did almost 80 run-throughs of, of my routine in, in like a more or less full sense. Um, some days I would do up to about eight, um, and that was just for the repetition. But like in the end, it was about just getting in the zone. Um, you know, I'd listen to music that would pump me up like right before, right before doing a rehearsal, um, just anything to, to get me to switch on. And then once I was switched on and that alongside the judges, like the mindset of, Hey, the judges are people too. And I was there to share an experience with them. The sharing part was super important to me. That sort of goes a little bit hand in hand with the, the spirituality side, but like, I just wanted to share a moment and, uh, sharing the coffee and the concept and just that that little moment, that 15 minutes, that was super important to me. Right. Um, and a lot of the feedback that the judges gave was very positive about that. They were like, oh, wow, the 15 minutes flew by, didn't want it to end. It was right, really, right, really right, lovely. Right. Yeah, 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 move, move, yeah, continuing on that, uh, the spiritual side of it, one, of, one in my spiritual pursuits, I remember uh, reading, uh, I read the Bhagavad Gita in the ancient Indian yeah. spiritual texts, and one of the lessons that came out of it and now, now I see how it applies to a coffee competition is when you're engaged in an action, you have control of what you're doing, not the results. So if you're in a mm. competition, you're focused totally on what you're doing, whether or not you're going to win or lose or what the judges think almost, you have no control of that. So to be mindful and just aware of what you're doing and generally that, you know, I, I, you know the, the, the spiritual lesson is that's when relo- results in life come uh, best, not when you think about what, what am I going to get from this? but I'm doing everything I can as I'm doing it. And I saw a lot of that when I watched the competitions, that people were so, the people especially did well, like yourself, were in that zone. Mm. Mm. 100%. I never thought that that would be me, to be honest. Um, Like I was speaking to someone not that long after the competition, 
and it was an old friend from high school and I was just thinking like, wow, imagine if like 16 year old me could have seen me <laughs> and the amount that I've changed and developed since then. And then, you know, because went from being this introverted sort of uh, teenager to being this really extroverted and being able to, to put on a performance like that. And it was just such a, a different sort of thing. Yeah. In a sense, coffee has been an instrument for you to grow, not only in your coffee skills, but to grow as an individual. And then my next oh, yeah, question, 100%. yeah, the next question that would follow is, where do you go from here? Where would you like to see yourself in a few years? Would you like to have your own cafe, be a roaster? What what end of it uh, do you think you might be headed in? Oh, that is such an open-ended question. I don't know where I'm going to be in five minutes, let alone uh, in like three that's years. A great place to be. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, some of my like uh, I suppose ideas that I have, which. I'm not super attached to, like, you know, it could go one way or another. Um, I live, try to live anyway, most of my life around that in the, in the way that, you know, I can set an intention towards something, but if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen. That's all good. Mm-hmm. I would love to, like, love to be a bit more fixed in a place one time and do, uh, do like a cafe or a roastery or something. Probably a cafe would be ideal, or not even a cafe, especially a coffee shop, and offering like an experience-based mm-hmm. place, not just, hey, come in and get a drink mindlessly like a zombie and walk out, but somewhere where you can you know, meet and talk to people. And um, yeah, talking to people is a, is a key thing um, and providing an experience. Um, there's the uh, World Coffee and Good Spirits champion, um, Martin Hudak. He, he said it really perfectly. He's used to work at the American bar at the Savoy Hotel in London, which was voted best bar in the world at mm-hmm. some point. Super crazy, really nice guy, very, very switched on with service. And he said something which sort of stuck to me, and it was like, um, create moments and turn them into memories. Wow. So by, you know, capturing someone and just getting them to, you know, have a switch off in their in their brain or a switch on in their brain to like, oh, hang on, this is someone actually talking to me and connecting with me, and then, you know, trying to make their day a little bit better. I think over in the States, you guys have Cat and Cloud as well. Those guys seem to have it on lock with their, their sort of service mindset. They're all about making people's days better using coffee. And that just absolutely vibes with me. Right, right. I, I love that. It was a great, great quote you gave us there. And, and for me, you know, if you look at my background I, in radio and whatever, uh, I've done a lot in politics. I've interviewed all, most of the major political people in the U.S. And one of the reasons now I'm putting more energy into coffee uh, and coffee culture is because uh, politics tends to divide people and in many ways now brings out the worst in people. Uh, coffee, coffee mm. culture, I notice, uh, uh, brings people together and, and really brings out uh, a, a good barista uh, and, and not just skilled in making the coffee, but in actually connecting and communicating with those customers that want to be connected to and communicated with uh, really mm. elevates uh, the, the whole human experience. Uh, uh, mm. And... Uh, and, and again, uh, I will continue uh, to give thought to the, the spiritual uh, component of coffee, and, and, but I see a lot of uh, spiritual uh, lessons uh, uh, in my experiences visiting specialty coffee cafes, talking to people in coffee. It's an amazing group of people that you meet uh, with mm. diverse backgrounds, fascinating, and, uh, and uh, for the most part, the community is very, very supportive and collaborative and uh, it's been a real inspiration for me uh, to to uh, to connect with people like yourself that are really the uh, you know the 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 leading the vanguard in in special coffee and in in I see it in Europe but I can tell you in the states it's just exploding. I was all over Florida, places like Alabama, Louisiana, where and everywhere now a specialty coffee is starting to pop up and uh, people are becoming more and more interested in it. So I think uh, you know it, it's a, it's a bright future. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and I think there's some great people in the industry to lead the way. Thank you so very much mm-hmm. for your time today. I, I really appreciate it. Any final words you'd like to share with our listeners? Oh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to, to come over. And thank you for the kind words. Um, final word. Geez, I don't know. I'm really bad at doing stuff on the spot. Mm, well, well, maybe say, just uh, say, yeah. keep, keep being kind to people and uh, trying to be empathetic in service is something that I'm pretty passionate about. Great. Trying to see the, the other side of, uh, of people, you know, why is that person, what, what do they want, why are they acting that way? And I don't know, if you can be more empathetic, the world seems to be a bit better of a place. Great, fantastic. And I, and I also want to say, uh, 
if you're in, uh, first of all, uh, for my American listeners, come to Sweden. It's a great place. People speak English. <laughs> uh, Stockholm, Gothenburg, these are great. Malmo, these are great cities. And uh, in, mm. if you're in Stockholm, go to Drop Coffee. It's it's a, a fabulous place. Meet Matt, meet Joanna. You're going to meet some great people <laughs> there. And and I say 100%. that, I mean, there's a lot of great cafes where I meet great people. But for sure, uh, that's, that's a place you should stop and visit. And uh, until next time. So uh, we will stay in touch. And, and anybody uh, listening in uh, has any ideas for anybody for me to interview from anywhere, we're, we're always uh, up for that. And uh, again, uh, Matt, thank you so very much for your time. Thanks so much, Dennis. You take it easy, hey? Too.